Here we are again, part five of 10 in our series on contemplation. And again, just to remind you, this series is only giving you snippets from our much longer, full-length, extended e-course on contemplation, Sacred Mystery, A Course on Contemplation, which is 20 hours long. So if you want to take the full plunge, you can find it at johncrowder.net, and I promise it is transformative. Now, this week, I'm going to re-emphasize the grace of this practice, then start easing into our first pragmatic tools, which is mainly to actually sit down and do it. <laughs> Contemplation is the vital subjective experience of an objective gospel reality. It helps us to perceive all of life as divine experience. Now, ultimately, all of Christian mysticism is summed up in contemplation, which is simply another word for the practice of the presence of God. And this practice is not getting or acquiring God's presence, but rather living in an intimate awareness of it. Similarly, faith itself is the participatory realization of your union with Christ, not a transactional thing you drum up to get it. Contemplation is merely relationship. The gospel is the constitutive agency of our union with God. Contemplation mediates that union, not as an abstraction to the person and work of Jesus, but it is the mode of our participation in that unbreakable union. Now, I know the word mediate can trigger us, and therefore I used it intentionally. <laughs> Look, preaching, scripture reading, communion, baptism, the love of a friend— these all mediate gospel truth to us in a sacramental way. How would we experience the gospel without these things? Not in the sense of replacing the mediator Jesus, but tangible graces in declaring him to us. See, again, modern evangelicals, with their logic chopping, they don't even know what sacraments are. They don't even know what that word means. The Greek means mysteries, okay? I got a three-part video series on sacrament as well. I don't care if you get it. I just don't have time to explain it right now, okay? Of course, anything can be viewed in a transactional, non-gospel way that reinforces the lie of separation. The Lord's table, for instance, is not a magic pill you, that gets you into Jesus. It's a sacramental declaration that the whole cosmos is united to him. So contemplation is not a go-between method. It's a mode of recognizing what is. Contemplative prayer is participation in the life of the Trinity. Participation is not applying the work of Christ, appropriating the work of Christ, or any other word that entails helping Jesus finish his unfinished business. Participation does imply interaction, exchange, interplay, relationship, communication, partaking, or even synergizing. You know, that's a Greek word that clunkily gets translated as co-labor in most English Bibles. Contemplation is the simplicity of engaging in the relational adoration of Father, Son, and Spirit. Extremely profound. It is the partaking of the glory of the triune God, shared together from before the foundation of the world, now as full shareholders in all that God is. Unfortunately, prayer itself has become a manufactured abstraction from that relationship as something you do, a contractual execution of duty. Thomas Merton says this, he says, basically, prayer should be as simple as breathing, as simple as living. But when we make a great issue out of prayer, it tends to become confusing. It tends to get distorted. It becomes a cause, the great cause of prayer. And then it becomes opposed to something else, which is not prayer. You get into this break. Prayer is something sacred, and other things are secular, and you have to keep them apart, and that's a confusion. He says, as breathing is neither sacred nor secular, you just breathe, so prayer, too, should be neither sacred nor secular. I do not regard prayer as a specifically sacred activity. It is life. It is our life. It comes from the very ground of our life. I think it becomes a sacred activity when it gets to become quite public and formal and so forth, but we should not divide prayer against the rest of our life. And we should not make prayer a cause for which we are willing to fight and have crusades, so to speak. Okay, so I am not dependent on my own prayers. Therefore, I can truly pray with freedom. 
we only are participants in Jesus' perfect divine human intercession to the Father. As Scripture tells us, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans and words words cannot express. So even when you are utterly confused about the things of God or your present situation in life, you can rest assured he interprets your desires, your groans, your longings, despite that you don't know how to pray. I'm always hesitant to give pragmatic tools because folks are so prone to view this stuff as mechanical. And so I'm going to hammer this home all the more later in the series. And I don't mean to sound patronizing, but start with a chair. Okay, (laughs) that's right. You listen to this whole thing so far for me to tell you, sit in a chair and be quiet. But seriously, if your prayer life consists of just lying in bed when you wake up in the morning, let's be brutally honest with ourselves, that doesn't work. All right, if you lie in bed, you fall asleep. As a teenager in the late 90s, after the Toronto renewal was blown through, I mastered this art of acting like I was laying on the floor, soaking during my pastor's sermons, and I could even fall asleep with my hands in the air, uh, resting on the elbows. But sometimes the snoring would give me away. And hey, guys, sleep is beautiful. Uh, When I was with the monks on Mount Athos, I actually wanted to wake up all night for the rich, entrancing prayers and liturgies. It was like IHOP, except with God. But on the flip side, don't bother kneeling or doing some uncomfortable thing like that because the whole time you're just going to be thinking about how uncomfortable you are. So get a chair, not a big lazy boy you're going to fall asleep in, but get out of bed. Make a coffee, okay? My number one piece of advice when you first wake up is not to grab that godforsaken phone, allowing your barely waking mind to be inundated with news about Donald Trump and CNN and everybody's agendas and irascible arguments, all of which is going to frame your outlook for the day and dictate your mood when you haven't even woken up yet. So let the beginning of your day be a time for centering. Depending on your living situation, you may need to rise a little earlier or stay up a little later than other people. It'll be different for everyone. But start small if you need to, 5, 15 minutes. I'd shoot for 20 or 30 minutes in the morning, and some also like to do another 30 minutes before bed. Find a time, stick with it. I personally just give it a long stretch in the morning, uh, but sometimes a brief pause in the middle of the day can be very replenishing to recalibrate. But consistency is important. So do get yourself into a habit. Some days you sit there and nothing happens. Hey, that's great. At least you sat down. You never know what's going on under the surface. You sit down one day, your head's a jumble, sit down the next day, and you're just soaring. Okay, we never know how Holy Spirit may be working out some subconscious stuff. Now, I do not set a clock. You may need to for work or whatever, but with clocks, the problem is you're always looking at it, you're on edge, you know, the alarm's going to sound at some point. I have a little stash of prayer candles, and I know about how far 30 or 40 minute uh, burn goes. So, Uh, Don't light your house on fire. For me, that's just more of a meditative way to keep time. That's not important, okay? The main thing is that you do find a way to carve out time, however you choose to mark it. Now, I've spent years um, without and with consistent quiet time. Okay, life, travel, kids, work happens, right? I've appreciated the spirit-led spontaneity the awareness of my constant union and not depending on a prayer time with God. So I don't sit down every day out of a legalism, but out of an addiction. And and it becomes a necessity to function because without habit, I tend to forget silence until I find myself in an exhausted, confused mess. Okay, so carving out space is very important so that you have real solitude. I mean, that's our main lesson I'll get to because that is really the starting point for this whole thing. You can't really untether from the world if you're sitting in your living room while your spouse is vacuuming and the kids are watching TV. Now, this part may be new for you, okay? We aren't playing worship songs, not reading a devotional book, nothing wrong with that. Worship songs can be beautiful. Uh, That is called meditation. You're reflecting on something. Discursively, your mind is ruminating on the lyrics or whatever. And it's framing up thoughts for you. It's like the apps where people read meditations of scripture with music. If you love those, if you love worship music, make space in your day for that. Contemplation is different. Contemplation, by definition, is not thinking about God. It's letting go of mental preoccupation, being with him, and having rest from our thoughts. Even our highest theological thoughts have ceilings. 
And it's funny how often people get confused at this point. They're like, wait, you're talking about actual silence? Yes. Now, I do often play ambient chants or some choral music lightly in the background, but only in Russian or Latin or whatever. Nothing in English or a language that, that's going to get me distracted with the words, okay? Just something ambient may help so you're not thrown off by that vacuum cleaner in the other room. Also, I am not trying to work myself into some altered state so the music is not for some kind of hypnosis effect. Um, now, don't replace your Bible reading or whatever existing devotional activity you're currently benefiting from. We're not looking to replace your other study time. In fact, you may start to find your time with those books growing deeper, growing richer. But this is not reading time. This is wordless silence. Nevertheless, you may want to start your practice with a couple short Bible verses when you first sit down. This is a very helpful launching pad. Okay, and I'll get into this in session seven when we discuss Lectio Divina, divine reading, which is different from regular Bible study. It's more of a tool to help you enter into silence. Now, I personally pray with icons. You know what? That may not be your tradition. I enjoy it. If my mind wanders, they're beautiful visual reminders of who I'm sitting here with. Now, I did not say I pray to icons. Nobody does that. That is a Protestant myth to demonize what they don't understand. I mean, worshiping with smoke machines and electric guitars, that's fine, but worshiping with icons, that's idolatry. Now, come on, let's grow up. I could care less if you use them or not. I'm not selling them online. It's not a superstitious or ritualistic thing for me. But having a sacred space, a prayer closet of sorts, is extremely beneficial. Even better if it has some aesthetic. Beauty's inspiring. And simple can be beautiful. I just find icons more inspiring than a live, laugh, love sign from a Cracker Barrel. But carving out space where you can have actual solitude, that's what I'm getting at. Okay, You don't need a shrine with candles and chants and icons if that's not your thing. I'm personally drawn to that atmosphere of the ancient tradition. So I like that stuff. My wife, she likes to go outside. She's a nature person. Her spirit soars when she's in the woods with a sunset. But cultivating silence definitely means finding time, space, uh, and silence. <laughs> Many of you will still initially find much more connection with your regular worship music, if that's something you do. And you know what? That is perfectly normal and okay. And I'm not minimizing that. Okay, ease into this. Don't make hard work of it. We're so accustomed to thinking silence is absence that it takes time to acclimate. If you're just getting started, don't worry too much about the details. I mean, some folks uh, get anal retentive about breathing exercises or how to place your hands or whatever. And we don't focus on tools. Tools are just there to help us focus on him. For instance, some people close their eyes to shut out distractions. Others keep them slightly cracked open so they don't fall asleep. All right, Don't overanalyze too much. Again, this is a relationship, not methodology. You aren't earning anything. Don't force yourself. We aren't forcing out thoughts, battling them. We're having a calm disposition and just learning to let go of thoughts. Let them coast along on that sushi belt without digging into them and pondering over them. You're giving yourself permission for a while not to have to think through and solve every problem that comes to mind. So if I find myself obsessing, I'm like, you know what? This is not the time for that. That's for later. This is my daily vacation. This is my sabbatical from analysis. A very helpful tool we will talk about in our next session is to have a simple prayer word, Jesus, that you faintly whisper as you start to find your mind wandering completely off into left field. So I'm, I'm just giving suggestions, but the main three things are for today, actual space, actual silence, actually doing it. C.S. Lewis says, we live, in fact, in a world starved for solitude, silence, and privacy, and therefore starved for meditation and true friendship. This is not just interior solitude as a concept, but finding some type of geographic corner to actually pull away, all right? We aren't being alone. We're being alone with God, but a corner, a room, a closet, a garage where we can actually pull away. And on this note, I would like to close out today's session with a lengthy but inspiring quote on this very thing from Thomas Merton. Here we go. And this is from New Seeds of Contemplation. 
He says, physical solitude, exterior silence, and real recollection are all morally necessary for anyone who wants to lead a contemplative life. But like everything else in creation, they are nothing more than means to an end. And if we do not understand the end, we will make a wrong use of the means. We do not go into the desert to escape people, but to learn how to find them. We do not leave them in order to have nothing more to do with them, but to find out the way to do them the most good. But this is only a secondary end. The one end that includes all others is the love of God. How can people act and speak as if solitude were a matter of no importance to the interior life? Only those who have never experienced real solitude can glibly declare that it makes no difference and that only solitude of the heart really matters. One solitude must lead to the other. However, the truest solitude is not something outside you, not an absence of men or of sound around you. It is an abyss opening up in the center of your own soul. And this abyss of interior solitude is a hunger that will never be satisfied with any created thing. The only way to find solitude is by hunger and thirst and sorrow and poverty and desire, and the one who has found solitude is empty as if he had been emptied by death. He is advanced beyond all horizons. There are no directions left in which he can travel. This is a country whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. You do not find it by traveling, but by standing still. Yet it is in this loneliness that the deepest activities begin. It is here that you discover act without motion, labor that is profound repose, vision in obscurity, and beyond all desire, a fulfillment whose limits extend to infinity. Although it is true that this solitude is everywhere, there is a mechanism for finding it that has some reference to actual space, to geography, and physical isolation from the towns and the cities of people. There should be at least a room or some corner where no one will find you and disturb you or notice you. You should be able to untether yourself from the world and set yourself free, losing all the fine strings and strands of tension that bind you by sight, by sound, by thought to the presence of other people. But thou, and thou shalt pray, enter into thy chamber, and having shut the door, pray to thy father in secret. Once you have found such a place, be content with it. and Do not be disturbed if good reason takes you out of it. Love it and return to it as soon as you can. And do not be too quick to change it for another. You know, Merton says, sometimes you're, you're going to get routed from your quiet time. Don't despise this. Don't get mad at people. But find a place where you can pull away. He continues, A place in which you can breathe naturally, quietly, and not have to take your breath in continuous short gas. A place where your mind can be idle and forget its concerns. Descend into silence and worship the sacred and secret. There can be no contemplation where there is no secret. We have said that the solitude that is important to a contemplative is above all an interior and spiritual thing. We have admitted that it is possible to live in deep and peaceful interior solitude even in the midst of the world and its confusion. But this truth is sometimes abused in religion. There are people dedicated to God whose lives are full of restlessness and they have no real desire to be alone. They admit that exterior solitude is good in theory, but they insist it is far better to preserve interior solitude while living in the midst of others. In practice, their lives are devoured by activities and strangled with attachments. Interior solitude is impossible for them. They fear it. They do everything they can to escape it. What is worse, they try to draw everyone else into activities as senseless and devouring as, as their own. They're great promoters of useless work. They love to organize meetings and banquets and conferences and lectures. They print circulars, write letters, talk for hours on the telephone that they might gather a hundred people together in a large room where they'll fill the air with smoke and make a great deal of noise and roar at one another and clap their hands and stagger home at last patting one another on the back with the assurance that they have all done great things to spread the kingdom of God. You will never find interior solitude unless you make some conscious effort to deliver yourself from the desires and the cares and the attachments of an existence in time and in the world. Do everything you can to avoid the noise and business of people. Keep as far away as you can from where they gather, cheat, and insult one another, to exploit one another, to laugh at one another, to mock one another with their false gestures of friendship. Be glad if you can keep beyond the reach of their radios. Do not bother with their unearthly songs. Do not read their advertisements. The contemplative life certainly does not demand a self-righteous contempt 
for the habits and diversions of ordinary people. But nevertheless, no one who seeks liberation in light and solitude, no one who speaks, seeks spiritual freedom can afford to yield passively to all the appeals of a society of salesmen, advertisers, and consumers. Keep your eyes clean, your ears quiet, and your mind serene. Breathe God's air. Work, if you can, under the sky. But if you have to live in a city and work among machines and ride in subways and eat in a place where the radio makes you deaf with spurious news and the food destroys your life and the sentiments of those around you poison your heart with boredom, do not be impatient, but accept it as the love of God and as a seed of solitude planted in your soul. If you're appalled by those things, you'll keep your appetite for the healing silence of recollection. But meanwhile, keep your sense of compassion for the people who have forgotten the very concept of solitude. You at least know it exists and that it is the source of peace and joy. You can still have hope for such joy. They do not even hope for it anymore. So finding a place, guys, it, it is part of contemplation because there, there is a necessary letting go. There is a sense of renunciation of things for a moment just to be saturated in him so that we are actually connecting with him in others all around us. He says, perfect renunciation establishes one in a state of spiritual solitude, peace, tranquility, clarity, gentleness, and joy, in which one is fully disposed for meditation and contemplative prayer. There is no true solitude except interior solitude. And interior solitude is not possible for anyone who does not accept their right place in relation to others. There is no true peace possible for one who still imagines that some accident or talent of grace or virtue segregates them from other people and place them above them. Solitude is not separation. Beautiful. Guys, the contemplative journey is not a path of becoming. It is a path of realization of what we've already become in him. It is awakening to a transformation that has already taken place. Our journey is one of discovering the true self, and this is but a byproduct of something much greater, the real discovery of Christ in us, the only means by which we would ever know ourselves anyway. Self-discovery in itself is vanity, a chasing after the wind. What self? He is your life. I have been co-crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Galatians 2.20. Beyond simple, the gospel is an absolutely effortless unveiling of the truth of the Godhead in you. We are not arriving into him, but realizing he arrived into us. This is the drastic difference between a process of frustration and a process of never-ending wonder. We've got some fun in-person gatherings coming to a region near you in 2024. So before you go, let me tell you where I'm headed. I'll be in Albuquerque, New Mexico in August. I'll be in New England, coming to Massachusetts in October. In November, I'll be with Dr. C. Baxter Kruger in Germany, as well as in Switzerland. And I'll be in Middle America in Ohio in December. Check it out, johncrowder.net. Check out our monthly live web conference platform, The Inner Sanctum, at thenewmystics.tv. It's where I give live, full-length lectures, interactive Q&A sessions. Plus, you have hundreds of hours of archived teaching, Bible commentary found nowhere else. And your small membership fee helps support our orphanages and missions around the world. So it's a win-win. Finally, please visit our main site, johncrowder.net, where you can find upcoming events like this ministry cruise to Alaska, September 2024, with myself and Dr. C. Baxter Kruger. You'll find our extended on-demand e-courses, like this 20-hour module on Christology. We've also got 20 hours just on contemplation. A really fun one, Drunk Church History. It's about 30 hours long. And our most recent on the book of Revelation that will change everything you thought about the apocalypse. So visit the page and you'll see we also have our longest e-course to date coming up live this summer, 2024, with myself, 
Dr. Baxter Kruger, Rod Williams. We're spending three whole months on Holy Spirit. And for those taking the online course, at the end of those 12 weeks, we will have an optional in-person activation gathering in Florida that is absolutely going to explode. Find everything at johncrowder.net. Plunge into the depths of the gospel of grace and sign up for Cana New Wine Seminary. Explore the heart of the Trinity, the ancient faith, the finished work of the cross. It's supernatural and presence-oriented. The online format makes it an extremely affordable theology course, and it's a rare opportunity to drink from some amazing teachers once a week. Catch the early bird discount rate at cana.co. Holy Spirit is often referred as the third person of the Trinity. But is the Trinity a hierarchy? Is Holy Spirit truly God? In a recent poll among 3,000 evangelicals, the majority believed Holy Spirit is a force, not a person. Yet the early church adamantly declared that Holy Spirit is the Lord, the giver of life, who spoke by the prophets and who is worshipped and adored together with Father and the Son. Many charismatics, though open to the Spirit's interaction, likewise think of Holy Spirit as a power or energy which comes in degrees. Holy Spirit doesn't come in portions. Holy Spirit comes in person. What does it mean that Holy Spirit has already been poured out on all flesh? Holy Spirit is hovering over humanity, pointing us to Christ, who reveals the Father. For a truly Trinitarian grasp of Holy Spirit that is both theological and deeply experiential, we would like to invite you this summer for a three-month extended online e-course with myself, John Crowder, together with C. Baxter Kruger and Rod Williams, exploring the often neglected person of the Godhead, Holy Spirit. Each week, we'll gather online for live, interactive discussions with students and participants June through August 2024. Live sessions are time zone friendly for the USA, the UK, and Europe. At the end of the course, we will cap it off with an optional in-person gathering on the Emerald Coast of Florida with Warren Sylvester leading worship. Holy Spirit is illuminating and making the reality of our union with God known to us in superabounding wonder. After 12 weeks of deep teaching on Holy Spirit, this in-person gathering is about tangible impartation as we come together to experience a deeper divine reality than words can express. Find out more about the course as well as the impartation weekend and take advantage of the early bird discount at johncrowder.net slash spirit. Hey guys, could I just take a second to say thank you to all of you who walked with us through the years, you've supported the message, you've thrown yourself into this glorious gospel together with us. You've attended our courses, events, schools, mission trips. You've journeyed with us in good times and in hard times. And I want you to know that I appreciate you. We couldn't have done what we've done without your love and your trust. This is not an offering plea. I have no hidden agenda. I just want you to know what an encouragement it's been to us not to walk this road alone. So thank you.